Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Linking Cultures, Connecting the Literatures of Southeast Asia. My name is Francesca Rendell Short. I'm a professor of creative writing at RMIT and co founder of Nonfiction Lab and RICE, which is the Writers Immersion and Cultural Exchange. And I'm your host for this event this evening. To begin, I would like to acknowledge the people of the Wurrung and Burrung language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nations on whose unceded land we are here today. I want to acknowledge First Nations' enduring connection with land, water, community and culture, and acknowledge their literatures and the telling of stories for tens of thousands of years. I want to acknowledge and pay my respects to ancestors and elders, past and present, and any First Nations people who are joining us today. This event, Linking Cultures, presented by Nonfiction Lab at RMIT and RICE, is thrilled to partner with RMIT Culture. RMIT Culture unites the university's public cultural spaces, creative programs and cultural collections, as well as supporting RMIT's learning and teaching activities and sharing its research with our public audiences. And RMIT Culture offers a curated program of in this beautiful space, the capital, which is where we are here tonight, dedicated to building a community of culture lovers. <clears throat> the conversation you'll hear tonight is an extension of the RICE program, which began in 2014, and it has brought together more than 80 writers from around the Asia Pacific region, three of whom are here tonight. At the heart of RICE is the proposition that there is great value in creating sp spaces and opportunities for writers to connect and share ideas deeply with other writers from different cultures and across generations. And as I said, all three panelists tonight are involved in one way or another with the RICE program. So let me introduce them and welcome them here to the stage now. So from Jakarta in Indonesia on the screen, we have Mikhail Johani. Mikhail is a poet, critic and translator based in Jakarta. His works has been, have been published extensively internationally. His English translation of Gratia Gusta's Shananya Rompus's poem, One by One the Bodies Died, won an honourable mention for the Hawker Prize for Southeast Asian Poetry. He is the author of We Are Nowhere and It's, and it's Wow. We Are Nowhere and It's Wow. And he's a Rice alumni from this year's residency in 2022. So welcome, Mikhail. Thank um, you. Thank you. Yes. So on stage on my right here, next to Mikhail, is Alvin Pung. He's a writer, poet, and editor from Singapore, whose work has been translated into more than 20 languages. In 2022, he was a Shivi Teller Rani Era Fellow and Dublin Literary Award Judge. His recent books include Uninterrupted Time and Det Somge Osavara Nam. He has a PhD from RMIT and is an adjunct professor in writing and publishing and is a Rice alumni from the very first residency in 2014. So welcome, Alvin. Lily Rose Tope from the Philippines is a scholar who has published widely on Southeast Asian literature in English and Asian literature in translation. She is professorial lecturer and former head of English and comparative literature at the University of the Philippines. She has a PhD from the National University of Singapore and is author of Un, in brackets, Framing, Southeast Asia, Nationalism and the Post-Colonial Text in English in Singapore, Malaysia and the Philippines. Lily is a partner investigation on our RICE ARC Discovery Grant called Connecting Asia-Pacific Literary Cultures, Grounds, Encounter and Exchange. So please welcome Lily. 
So how this conversation will work tonight is that Mikhail, Alvin and Lily will now converse and talk together about what it means to connect and exchange culture and story in this region. And there will be time for Q&A at the end, so please get your questions ready for that. So welcome everyone, and over to you, Lily, who I believe is going to kick it off. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I will begin the conversation with a very short introduction to Southeast Asia. When I was in Singapore, a friend sent me a Christmas card, and in the address she wrote, Singapore, China. So she thought that Singapore was in China. So I always begin with geography. Asia is uh, divided rather strangely because we have an East Asia whose central culture is China. We have a South Asia whose central culture is India. And everything else in between is called Southeast Asia. There used to be West Asia, but it's now called the Middle East, and there has been absolutely no North Asia. So what we're looking at will be those countries in between uh, by virtue of uh, closeness and by virtue of uh, history uh, are now called Southeast Asia. Well, once upon a time, these Asian, Southeast Asian countries were composed of uh, small kingdoms who used to trade with each other. They would go to each other's place. So, uh, imagine it as a little neighborhood uh, and each one would go to each other's house uh, to mingle, to eat, to trade. But when colonialism, uh, well, the colonizers invaded Southeast Asia, all of a sudden, those houses closed its windows and forgot that they had neighbors. And uh, depending on how long the, colo the colonialism was in each country, then that's also how long that these windows were closed. The Philippines and Indonesia were colonized the longest, 300 years or more. Um, the rest of Southeast Asia by the British, uh, perhaps by a century. And after the, the Second World War, these countries became independent and they started opening their windows and rediscovered that they had neighbors, but they do not know their neighbors anymore. And slowly, these countries reconnected, first by politics and diplomacy, then by trade and security. However, our concern now is that the cultural connections have not been as fast as we would like it to be. So we are here today to discuss why this is so and what can be done to facilitate or to hasten the connections among the countries of Southeast Asia. Okay, so this is where I, I take over. Now, I, I want to add to what uh, Lily said by saying that um, Southeast Asia did not just trade and, and interact with one another. Uh, before the 16th century, Southeast Asia was in some ways the pioneer of what we now call globalization. The ancient Romans knew about this, uh, about us. Uh, Ptolemy had, had maps featuring Southeast Asia. China, India, the great civilizations of the past knew about us. Why was that? Because we were the Spice Islands. We were uh, the source of many of the goods. There was a healthy trade back and forth between what we now call Europe and what we now call Southeast Asia. Uh, we were always the middleman at the crossroads in that trade, as well as a source of goods as well. Uh, and more recently, in the 13th to 15th, 16th centuries in particular, there was a very healthy trade. In, you know, we call it the maritime Silk Road. So you know about the Silk Road where, you know, uh, goods and silk from China was, would go would pass the desert, go through India and go all the way to Europe, Marco Polo and all that. There was also a very healthy exchange of goods all along the, the coastal lines, uh, going to Oman, East Asia and so on. Um, and therefore, when, when the, the eunuch emperor Zhen He, the famous eunuch emperor, was, uh, you know, brought his fleet of treasure ships from China all the way to East Africa, famously brought back a giraffe. He stopped along the major ports in Southeast Asia as well as in, in what is now called the Middle East, 
not because he was discovering these places. It's not a narrative of discovery. He was following very well-established routes of interaction, right? And re-establishing ties, uh, showing off a little bit as well, of course. So what we're talking about is centuries, if not millennia, of very deep connections that was very abruptly broken uh, by the European colonial and imperial entry into, into our waters. And it is an intervention that continues to this day. Uh, you know, like the, the Americans uh, are more recent, most recently imposing this narrative of the Indo-Pacific. And I'm like, what the hell is the Indo-Pacific, you know? We call ourselves Southeast Asia, the Asia-Pacific. Indo-Pacific is a very specific and very new kind of narrative. So I think Southeast Asia has a, had a long history of exchange and interaction. It's a very syncretic um, region, taking its influences from different parts of the world. And you see, the, you see this in the cuisine, in the fabrics, and I might argue the literatures as well. But it's also a, a, a region of great amnesia. Uh, we have, as Lily pointed out, forgotten uh, that we once had this great connectivity. Uh, it's, it's almost like our network protocols have changed, right? And we no longer know how to talk to one another. Uh, but I think there is great value in, in reconnecting. And I think with the internet, with events like this, with opportunities like RICE, uh, we're learning slowly what it means to reconnect in the 21st century. And I want to add something perhaps provocative is, uh, I see Australia as in some ways part of Southeast Asia as well and part of the conversation. Uh, and, and I also want to think about the ways in which uh, this community over here, adding its 20 to 25 million or so voices, uh, to the broader conversation that is Southeast Asia. Uh, Mikhail, do you want to you add your, your context as well? Um, yeah, like, um, <clears throat> I think I, I agree with you about the uh, sort of long history of cultural exchanges between Southeast Asian countries. And uh, I think it resulted in a sort of, uh, you know, extensive, I think some people call it cosmopolitan intimacies between us, you know, and um, but, um, and it actually continued even after colonization, you know, like, um, um, in like, uh, I think this book called Citizen Motion, like I, I read about how like, um, gramophones, um, are traded, you know, from somehow, uh, the RCA Victor, um, record company, uh, sells a lot of records in Rangoon and it made, uh, the records made their way to like Singapore and then Jakarta really fast you know like so we get like all these jazz records in the 30s you know um uh sometimes sooner than like uh countries in europe you know <laughs> and um but um i think the cold war and uh, decolonization um sort of also put a stop to that like in the context of indonesia like in uh we had the asia africa conference uh in bandung in 1985 and after that, um, uh, we have like, we even established like um, the Asia Africa Writers Bureau in uh, Colombo, you know, and like uh, we try to maintain this uh, cosmopolitan intimacies between uh, what are now called the Global South countries. But um, <clears throat> because of the, uh, in, people probably have heard about this, like the 1965 massacres in uh, Indonesia, where the uh, leftist writers um, were uh, killed or exiled, and 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 the the, the Asia Africa project sort of stalled, stopped entirely. Uh, Indonesia became much more insular, and we looked more inwards rather than you know like uh, 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 outwards. So yeah, what can we do about that? <laughs> so so. Uh, uh, I think this segues nicely into one question I had for, for both of you. Uh, Indonesia is practically the size of the US, almost 300 million people. Um, <clears throat> Philippines, of course, over 100 million people. You're, you're, you're probably the two largest uh, nations in Southeast Asia. Massive, uh, Mikhail, you're saying insular. You, you have a large enough domestic uh, culture and market 
to to not need the rest of Southeast Asia in a sense. So I, I'm curious about how Indonesia and the Philippines regards the region and your place in it. Do, do you is Southeast Asia even in your consciousness or or not? And if so, uh, what is the place of Southeast Asia in Indonesia and the Philippines? And what is the place of Indonesia and the Philippines from a cultural point of view in Southeast Asia? Okay, I'll answer first. Um, honestly, frankly, uh, Southeast Asia is not very much in the imagination of the Philippines. The Philippine culture and especially Philippine education is geared towards America. So our school system, our educational system is Amer patterned after that of uh, the United States. And so the curriculum does not offer much uh, in terms of uh, Southeast Asian literature. But uh, I think um, a decade ago, we tried to change this and introduce courses that uh, include Southeast Asian literature and I see in my students' eyes that they are looking at this text for the first time. They are uh, discovering that uh, they have a lot in common with their neighbors. They are discovering that, uh, well, that they, there are neighbors. And uh, I think that will snowball later on into more interest in Southeast Asia. But of course, that is as far as education is concerned. There are more serious issues in publishing uh, that prevents um, the importation of uh, Southeast Asian books into the Philippines. So I think the reason why we are not reading each other is that the market is not efficient. <laughs> And, and you're talking about, obviously there are problems of translation as well, but you're talking about even the significant uh, body of work that is in common languages like English or Bahasa and things like that. And yes, there is a lot of work being produced uh, in Southeast Asia in languages like English as well as the other languages as well. But we don't necessarily know about that and we don't necessarily uh, know about each other's work. And even if we do, uh, it can often be difficult to reach each other's markets. Yeah, Mikhail. Um, yeah, it's. I mean, it's funny to me that like um, uh, those cosmopolitan influences, uh, um, I think, continued with like other products of popular culture, like music and films. You know, like with MTV in the nineties, uh, Indonesians consume a lot of like uh, uh, music from the Philippines, like we raise the hats. Uh, uh, and uh, films from Malaysia and Singapore, but somehow books, not so much. <laughs> Even though like, uh, you know, like said, the middle class, upper middle class and nations, so they can read English and they can like, you know, a lot of them go to Singapore in the 80s to, you know, like go shopping, but they don't buy books. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, like if you talk about literature, um, like say in my experience, like um, I don't think much about about Southeast Asian literature uh, until very recently. You know, like it, all, it was almost like by accident. I met this uh, two Malaysian guys who um, were sort of like um, invited to the uh, uh, to to a festival, a literary festival in Jakarta, but they were like invited to the wrong thing, and they got really confused. So I, I thought like, oh, what are you guys doing here? And so. We hang out in Jakarta, and then I realized that, like, hang on, I don't know anything about Malaysian literature, but they know so much about us, but Indonesian. You know, like, even like our poets, like Ariel Anwar, there's taught in Malaysian uh, primary and high school, and I think he's taught in, um, in Singapore as well, you know. Um, but uh, we, I had no idea, but like, if you asked me back then in 2015, you know, like, one single contemporary Malaysian poet had no idea. So uh, um, I think like I, I've made it sort of my mission to like find out more uh, about Southeast Asian writers. And so that's what, how I finally met, you know, like Singaporean writers, you know, single lead people, you know, who've done a lot of like work, I think, in reconnecting <laughs> Southeast Asian, Asian writers. So kudos to you. Yeah. <clears throat> 
Okay. Uh, I also want to share my experience as a Filipino yeah. scholar and a Filipino student studying in uh, Singapore in the 90s. Um, there was not much uh, readings in our curriculum uh, on Southeast Asia, so I had to go to Singapore to study this uh, literature. And um, I am very, very thankful, grateful to translators like Harry Aveling, who's in the audience, for the works that have been translated from Bahasa. I'm also thankful and grateful to my friend Tony Lim, who is in the audience, whose family taught me Malaysian culture. But I don't think this experience can easily be replicated by an ordinary Filipino. Um, it will take uh, lots of media, both social and, and printed, to share the kind of experience that I had. And so I think that Southeast Asia uh, is seen by the Filipino. Singapore, for example, only as a place for employment. Uh, Malaysia also as a place for employment. Uh, Indonesia is seen as a place for business. Uh, but the cultural exchange lags behind uh, all these uh, um, all these goals, and I think uh, that should be remedied. Yeah, I, I really want to speak to the point that the cultural exchange and literary exchange lags behind a really very healthy economic and diplomatic exchange between the nations of Southeast Asia. You're talking about over 600 million people. It's, it's uh, not a small chunk of, of the world's population, as it were. And uh, we've been trading with one another, we've been exchanging, you know, uh, from, from an economic point of view, we've, we continue uh, to have very strong relations. If you notice those posters, uh, digital posters outside, they're they are a living example of that. They were photographs from the Royal Press in Malacca. And you'll notice they were, you know, they feature, for example, packaging. Uh, those date to the 60s, 70s, maybe, maybe earlier where the packaging for basic goods, pharmaceuticals, you know, liquor even, <coughs> was multicultural, right? Or multilingual. You, you would have to have packaging in, in all the different languages because that was the market. The market was very much, uh, you know, cut across borders, cut, a, cut across languages. And there was, a, there was a feeling that you would cater to that. You would happily uh, provide for the different markets that you have. It wasn't monolingual like it very often is right now. So that speaks to a time where there was a healthy exchange between cultures and between languages that I think uh, kind of has died down in the, in the contemporary, contemporary era. Uh, and I think that it's a great pity. It's a great pity. Uh, we were a lot more willing to talk to one another, including on a literary level. Uh, but that seems to have taken a backstage to other concerns. I mean, part of it uh, is the legacy of colonialism. I think there was, you know, post 60s, 70s, there was a, a focus in general in many of our, our communities towards economic development and cultural development, I think, took a back seat. And this is part of what was lost. Uh, but I think as we are coming up again in the world, em emerging middle class, uh, we are rediscovering not just stories and relations, but our need for stories and relations. And we're rediscovering uh, these, these old ties. Mikhail, what's your experience? Yeah, I mean, I mean, even this event is kind of funny to me because like uh, the three of us, Southeast Asians reconnecting, you know, my disembodied voice reconnecting with you, with you guys in Australia, you know, and with the other 650 million Southeast Asians probably not even watching us. <laughs> <laughs> doing the life work. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but it, things like this happens all the time, you know. Uh, and, and I think I, I have a question, you know, like uh, for, for both of you, actually. Um, you know, like before we get started on the reconnecting, you know, what do you guys think, like, um, what would be the best reason uh, for us to actually reconnect, you know? Like, uh, why do we have to do it? Uh, what for? Do we have to, you know, <laughs> for the future? <laughs> okay. Um, from my point of view, the reconnection is necessary 
First, from the point of view of knowledge, we have to know each other. After all, we are neighbors. Uh, much of the contentions that we experience come from uh, our lack of knowledge of each other. So I'll give you a good example. In 1995, a Filipina maid was hanged in Singapore. This is floor contemplation. And in Singapore, this was an ordinary thing. It merited only a very small portion in the newspaper. In the Philippines, the whole country was in uproar because the maids, the, the domestic helpers, uh, they are considered as heroes by the country. And Singapore has no right to execute uh, one of our heroes. So that kind of difference in mindset, that kind of difference in perspectives, is uh, the differences are not known either to the Singaporeans or to the Filipinos. So woe unto the Singaporean who goes into Manila during that time because uh, that person will be lynched. <laughs> so, um, but you know, the ordinary Singaporean didn't know this. Uh, and so that kind of ignorance of cultures, of perspectives, uh, the ignorance of histories uh, had caused uh, this kind of uh, this kind of uh, issues, these controversies, and had we known more about each other, <clears throat> then this would have not occurred. Uh, the other example that I will give you would be the issue on Sabah, which is a part of Malaysia. The Philippines thinks that it is uh, it belongs to it, but Malaysia, of course, thinks that it belongs to it. So a group of uh, armed men led by a sultan goes to Saba and tries to uh, stage a coup. Of course, uh, this doesn't push through. Uh, it was easily quelled by the Malaysian army. But such tragedies could be avoided had we known about each other or read about each other. So I, I want to add to that. On the plane here from Singapore, I watched... Uh, 3,000 Years of Longing, starring Tilda Sindran and Idris Elba, and it's based on an A.S. Bad uh, <coughs> short story. And there was a lovely line in there that, I, that struck me. Uh, and the line was, uh, we ought to understand those who have a hold over our lives. We ought to understand those who have a hold over us and our lives. And I think that's the best reason, I think, uh, for, for reconnecting with Southeast Asia. Like it or not, we are relatives. We are neighbors. We are an extended family. Um, our histories are intertwined. Our cultures are intertwined. The languages we speak, the food we eat, whether we remember or not, are intertwined. And unless we understand these connections deeply, uh, others will manipulate us to their own ends and we would forget the basis of... of where we come from and who we are. Two good examples, right? Uh, one is, you know, just like you have your floor contemplation thing. Uh, in this, I think it was the 60s, two uh, Indonesian paramilitary uh, figures bombed a building in Singapore. Today, we, would, we might call them terrorists. It was a political act from back in the day. Uh, and they were hanged, they were caught and hanged in Singapore as terrorists. In Indonesia, I believe they're, they're, they're monuments to them. They're considered national heroes. Uh, very recently, two warships in the Indonesian Navy were named after them, right? Um, we don't talk about it. We, we just let it be, and, and there are reasons for that. But we ought to understand why that is a thing. Another example, which is more literary, a few years ago in 2013, I flew over uh, to Singapore, I invited and flew over a group of uh, Burmese poets and writers uh, to Singapore to do a reading and so on. We had a packed audience, hundreds of people showed up, and we realized there was a deep interest in, in, uh, in, an, in a community that's part of Southeast Asia, but because of their politics and the military regime had been cut off from us. And I remember being very moved when the writers, one of the Burmese writers said, you know, we've waited for this reading for 50 years, right? And here's the thing, it turns out that some of, some among them, some of the writers among them had been working in Singapore for decades, right? 
uh, including in the Singapore government, in, in, in various fields, in IT and so on, we had no idea we had some of the leading lights of contemporary Burmese poets working and living in Singapore. Again, you know, we focus on, on, the, on, the, on the economic side of things. There are already relations. And on the cultural and literary side, you know, we fall behind and we forget we had these relations. Similar experience when uh, Crip and, and Jimmy and so on came to Singapore and they realized some of their books which are out of print back home in Manila are actually in our national library. <laughs> Mikhail, what, what about you? What do you think is a good reason to, to reconnect? Uh, yeah, uh, funnily enough, you know, like uh, uh, I drive my daughter to school every day uh, passing the road that's named after the two Indonesian terrorists slash heroes. <laughs> um, yeah, I think like the best, um, I think one of the best reasons, like uh, one of the best reasons that I that I think we should connect with each other is um, um, I think that that's sort of like a part of uh, the bigger sort of struggle uh, against the English dominated international book market. You know, <laughs> like uh, like I, my dream is um, even though I love English, I write in English. You know. But my dream is to uh, get to know each other's literature, uh, especially the ones that are not in, in English, uh, and bypass English. You know, like I'd like to be able to, like you know, read the Filip uh, Filipino novel in Indonesian translation rather than through English first. You know, reading, reading it in English and then, like you know, imagining how would this sound in Tagalog, uh, <clears throat> and. And yeah, I think I think there would be, uh, you know, like like right now, say Penguin Southeast Asia has based itself in Singapore, uh, but you know, is it, you know, is it doing much for Southeast Asian literature? Or is it just mining, you know, Southeast Asian literature to be published and sold in the U.S. and Australia? Say, um, so uh, <clears throat> uh, yeah, like I think we, I think it already happens as well, like. Say between Malaysia and Indonesia, I know that like some Indonesian poets are published in Malaysia because our language is sort of kind of the same, you know. And Malaysian uh, poetry scene, like the readers there, they read Indonesian poetry. They like Indonesian poetry. They even write in an Indonesian style, which is weird to me, but uh, you know, good for us. Uh, <laughs> uh, and and yeah, like we can just sell our books in Malaysia without having to be. Um, adjusted like the you know from Indonesia into to Malay uh, so yeah I think like one of the yeah, I think so like that's one of the reason that I uh, you know believe it is like to bypass all these gatekeepers I guess you know like gatekeepers such that you know um, uh, we hear too much but they exist <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah. and then uh, and, Having to go through them, think like the boat, uh, jump into the windows, the closed windows that like Lily mentioned. <laughs> yeah, I, just I, break it. Yeah, <laughs> I, I absolutely think we should read one another rather than wait for London or New York to tell us who to read or what to read. And I, exactly. I think there's yeah. there's there's something to be said about Southeast Asia. The one thing we do have that that's common across Southeast Asia is we are multilingual, multicultural societies. I mean, all of us here speak more than one language and, and often use more than one language in our daily lives uh, as, a, as a default, right? Um, I was once on a panel with the, the novelist, Pakistani novelist, Kamila Shamsi, and she's saying that uh, she faced this challenge when, when she writes in English, but increasingly uh, has realized that even the novel as a literary form is reflecting the world and becoming increasingly globalized. Uh, it's becoming difficult and not impossible to, to stick to having only one language. She writes, her novels include five languages. And I think we, we, are, we come from places where that is a fact of life. So even the way in which we write, even the way in which we use English, um, I, I, I always like to say, you know, we, we've upgraded the language, you know, we, we've, uh, we've taken it over and we've made it an Asian language. Mm -hmm. And our version, yeah. our use of the language in a literary sense 
is, is so much more nuanced and sophisticated. Uh, and we can learn from one another how to take uh, the literature forward. And we can relate to one another when we, when we you know, you're all nodding because you kind of get what I'm saying. Mm. Um, in a way that if we were to rely on the usual gatekeepers, as you're saying, they wouldn't get it. Like, like you know, they, they, yeah. they're still on 3G, whereas we're, we're doing 5G work, as I like to say. Lily, what, what do you think? Uh, as an educator, it has always been my advocacy to bring Southeast Asia to my classroom. And uh, one of the things that I have to admit uh, would be that I photostat illegally some of the books that I bring home because these books are not available in the Philippines. So we throw the Intellectual Property Act in the, in the bin, in the trash bin. Um, but I think um, my sin is justified in the sense that when I look at my students' faces and see the kind of wonder, you know, that, that is there when they read a Southeast Asian text and they say, oh, this sounds like me, you know, or, oh, you know, uh, this sounds like home, then I think uh, that justifies it. Um, and I think also that education or the school system, especially the universities, play a very big role, should play a big role in spreading uh, awareness of Southeast Asian literature, especially. Uh, if this works, the works of uh, our colleagues can penetrate the curriculum, the syllabi of most of our teachers, then there will be more awareness of uh, the writings of our neighbors. But anyway, I just want to share with you something that Mikael and I are doing. He sent me a poem based on a, a pop song written by a Filipino band. And in that song, in, in, sorry, in that poem, uh, he used Bahasa, but he also used Filipino. I think that's a very good example of intertextuality. And my students will read it in English, in Bahasa, and Filipino. Never mind if they don't understand the Bahasa part. But the fact that they experience these languages uh, in, you know, in just one poem uh, is already a kind of uh, a breaking down of boundaries. And I think this is the way to go. So I. I uh, it might be a nice time to bring in the Australian connection since we're here. Um, and, and of course, it's multiple mm -hmm. layers, right? First of all, there, there are the forgotten connections between the peoples of, of what is now called continental Asia and the long-standing ties you have uh, with, with Southeast Asia, you know, Torres Straits and, and the Flores Islands and, and Indonesia there, that are just... Um, waiting to be rediscovered and, and re-strengthened. And I believe Rice uh, is doing something uh, very soon to bring together writers from, from uh, these different communities uh, to, to talk about their work and so on. But more, more, more to the point, it is through Rice that we encountered and met one another. And it's through a program, oddly enough, uh, founded here, initiated here in Australia, RMIT to be specific, through the good work of uh, David Carling and Francesca Randall Short, that we had a voice, we had a platform, uh, we had an excuse for us to meet together and talk about these things. So, so this desire to once again connect, which was latent and very individual, uh, was brought together, and I, I would like to think given voice, uh, given a home, precisely because we had this chance to come together and, and to talk about this thing that we've all individually, privately felt a desire for, but haven't had a chance to come together. So it's become a, a very important forum um, for us to come together. And it's gotten me curious, right? What about the other way around? In, in what way uh, does Southeast Asia feature in the Australian imagination and, and vice versa? Uh, how how would, would we all like to speak uh, together and I don't know, maybe this is a good time uh, to, to hear from the audience and, and see if anyone has any views as, at all. Would anyone like to share something? I think there's a mic running around. 
Oh, um, thank you um, very much for the for the conversation. Um, I'd like to um, ask about your thoughts on, aside from the connections that you've been talking about, I think Southeast Asia also has this very strong tradition of speaking truth to power. So I, I, I'd like to know your thoughts about it. For example, I, I, it would be very nice, for example, if more Filipinos read Pramudia or the stories translated by Harry mm -hmm. and, and vice versa, because I think especially in the, in, in, in the politics in, in, in Southeast Asia today, I think modern day or present day Filipinos and Southeast Asians would learn a lot about how the different cultures spoke truth to power. Thank you. Truth to power, speaking truth. Okay, uh, I agree with you absolutely. Uh, I think uh, if many <coughs> more Filipinos were to read uh, works in, uh, from Southeast Asia, and as I said earlier, I am indebted to Harry Aveling for my knowledge of uh, the works in Bahasa, um, then uh, I uh, we would we would be more you know we, it would be easier to connect. Uh, it would be easier to understand each other, especially in terms of the concept of power. Uh, is that what you were referring to? Yes, uh, because Indonesia, for example, would have a different uh, idea of what power is. In the Philippines, uh, it's uh, both traditional and Western. Um, and if we can kind of you know see through each uh, each other, then um, it will be a good diplomatic tool. Uh, for us to uh, to gain what uh, regional cooperation or regional peace. Mikhail, do you? Uh, want to uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I think um, I think one thing that very important to uh, uh, remember is that like before these books like uh, Ramudia's Guru Quartets uh, were being translated. Um, a lot of people have been speaking uh, truth to power in, in Indonesia, uh, say in my, my own country. But, uh, so, like, don't wait until, uh, like Alvin said, don't wait until uh, all these books uh, that speak truth to power get translated into English to read it, <laughs> if if we could. Which is kind of ironic because I actually read Pramudia for the first time in English because uh, I went to school in uh, Australia when I was young and uh, my uncle Max Lane actually translated <laughs> translated Pramudia <laughs> so he was he was married to my auntie so <laughs> uh, so it, it, but but yeah so um, <clears throat> speaking through the power is it's I think I think like um, it's it's very yeah, like, I mean I don't know when that's gonna happen but I think yeah don't wait for the translation <laughs> so I, I, I want to add and say you're absolutely right. And there is something about Southeast Asia that there's always been a subversive streak when it comes to power. And maybe it comes from being such a syncretic culture that has seen so many empires come and go uh, over the centuries, right? Uh, we, we, we have a jaded almost understanding of how flags come and go, empires come and go. It might have something to do with the fact that we are very much an archipelago culture, uh, with a Tesalocratic understanding of what, what power means. Uh, it's never been easily centered. So we have a decentered idea of power. Uh, I, and, I'm, and, I, and I say this not just because of the literature, which we are, is clearly evident, but other cultural forms as well. If you look at the set, shadow puppetry, for example, and the Wayan Kulit, uh, and the way in which they tell and retell major narratives of power, but always in a subversive kind of way, like... You know, the Southeast Asian versions of the Ramayana are very different from the ones in India, for example. Uh, the way in which even, for example, East Asian and Chinese folk tales have been given a kind of twist, a very often subversive twist, very often sort of adopted uh, as satire, political satire <coughs> including. I think there are so many ways uh, in which we've forgotten that we've, we've built in these things into the way in which we interact, partly as a coping strategy, 
partly as a cultural strategy and creative strategy. And there is a lot, there is a lot to dis, uh, rediscover. And one of the reasons to reconnect is to remember we're no longer orphans of history. We are not. Uh, perhaps we never were. We've been told we're orphans. And we're rediscovering our, uh, for want of a better word, our birth families, right? The extended network of relations was always, always still there. Yeah, and also uh, I would like to share, I mean, in my studies, uh, there was a particular point in history where Southeast Asia were, was ruled by strong men. So there was Marcos in the Philippines, there was uh, uh, Suharto in Indonesia, Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore, and uh, Thailand was ruled by military and uh, the same with Burma or Myanmar. And... Uh, what happened here was that uh, uh, literature was, no, no, not literature, but the narrative, the historical narrative was uh, overtaken by the state narrative. And the only, <clears throat> the only uh, expression uh, of resistance that is possible is through literature. And so all these countries would have traditions of resistance. Uh, and this, I think, should be shared yeah. in the region. Uh, this, I think, should be uh, appreciated by people who have gone through similar experiences and learn, you know, they should learn from each other. So the fact that there is a common thread running through the literatures of resistance in Southeast Asia is, I think, already a good sign uh, of uh, of connection, okay. But uh, of course, uh, readership remains limited. Actually, a good example of that is contemporary Burmese poetry. During, under the military regime, they had to adopt uh, the the techniques of uh, conceptual poetry, language poetry, to escape the censors because the the censors couldn't understand that particular style of of postmodernist poetry, and they used that as a way to put across uh, you know, important political messages and speak truth to power as well. So there's all this going on uh, in a very dynamic, but also, let's face it, a very fraught region where, where the contemporary governments have inherited and then adopted and reproduced instruments of colonial power uh, in order to continue their, their control of, over, over the communities. So a lot of what we're seeing today started you know, like anti-gay laws being a classic example, internal security detention without trial in many countries, like my own, uh, were, were, you know, started out as colonial instruments, but they were continued and, and reproduced uh, in, in the post-independent governments uh, as instruments of power. So we're, we're, in a sense, still learning, finding ways to, to come out of that particular era. And part of, one of the instruments is precisely this amnesia, it's not by accident. It's a deliberate forgetting of these broader ties. Yeah. Uh, also, in some countries, to write means to die. <laughs> uh, before I came here uh, three days ago, no, four days ago, a Filipino writer was killed by the military. Why? Because he's a writer. So that kind of reality <clears throat> Uh, you know, slaps you in the face. So if you're one of the writers who come from a state-controlled country. So uh, writers from different countries who've gone through the same experience should be able to learn uh, from each other uh, and also uh, to recognize that in some places, writing is a, a kind of sacrifice. Uh, you know, you put your life on the line if you want to write, especially if you expose the truth. Another question over there. Thank you. I would like uh, to ask um, all of you, because you are poets, um, if you look at the culture, in particularly the haiku poems, you will see there's a, a Japanese structure, but when it comes to America, it become huge uh, group. And I don't recognize it as a haiku, but they say that their haiku is one point. 
The second point is they went there, they went to uh, Japan and become a monk because um, um, uh, Marshall um, was a um, haiku monk. Mm. So I think the big culture, if you want to look at it and if you want to analyze it, you have to look at religion because Buddhism is also about writing poems and the monks write poems. And for example, like the Vietnamese one, there are different group. It means they split it from Buddhists uh, from China and they also went there um, to learn and to translate it. And when they uh, split into a Vietnamese group, they also have a Vietnamese language group. It means because the, the, the founder um, translated uh, just like the Bible, then you cannot change it. But the communists came and they, they took over. Communists is another Buddhist group. Um, so at the moment, many Vietnamese um, overseas now, they, they look at the question, the teaching of the founder. It means that um, the, the, the old Vietnamese here, they say that you cannot change it because this is the word um, of the founder. And the other one said that, but uh, we don't understand all the, uh, our children will not understand. So I think linking culture, you have to look at it. And especially not many books write about Buddhism culture and because it, it changed from India to um, China and China dominated Vietnamese for a thousand of years. At the moment, the communists also went there to learn about Buddhism and become a monk. And they, they went overseas. It means that still poems. Thank you for that. Um, I, you, you, your, 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 your comments put me in mind of uh, the time when I visited the Buddhist library in Singapore. And I was very, very moved to realize that there's an entire section in the Buddhist library in Singapore dedicated to poetry. And you know, there's a great tradition of uh, <coughs> po poet poetry and poetic writing in Buddhism that uh, at, least, at least in one small library in Singapore, there is a record of the range. And I, I'm hoping and I'm trusting that the libraries here in, in Melbourne uh, and in Australia and perhaps in our countries as well have, have their own records of this. If not, there should be, so you're absolutely right. Um, on the matter of the haiku, uh, I, it's a really good opportunity for me to point out that, that I think for me reconnecting in Southeast Asia is not just about looking to the past and remembering the past. It's also looking to the future as well and realizing that uh, we're living cultures, we're growing cultures. Uh, we continue to innovate and to grow. And it is not just about uh, rediscovering tradition. We're also deeply modern, postmodern cultures. Uh, and one manifestation of that in our literature, I love to teach a course, I've actually taught it here in Australia as well, uh, about contemporary poetic forms, right? And, my, and our thinking is the sonnet came out of 15th, 16th century, you know, Europe, uh, because of a certain time and place, the haiku came out of a certain uh, tradition, so on and so forth, the Villanelle, the Sestina, and so on. All these forms that are famous now and taught in our schools came from somewhere, started somewhere. Why can't we, therefore, invent new forms? And if enough people pick them up and use them and write them, then they will become the new sort of formal structures of the future. So, so in, in Singapore, at least, and, and we extended it to Southeast Asia, we did exactly that. So we, we came up with a number of forms that now have entire sort of uh, selections of, of writers practicing them. There are anthologies that have come out or uh, you know, celebrating these forms. You have the Lee Woo Lee, you have the Twin Cinema, you have the Panera, Peroso, and so on. And, and now it, it's gotten me very curious about whether similar experiments are taking place in the Philippines, in Indonesia, and so on. So not just building, not just recovering the past, but, but looking to the future and inventing new ways of producing work, creating work uh, that will take us forward.
Yeah, um, uh, talking about Aiko, like Aiko is huge in Indonesia, and um, uh, like often said, like a lot of Indonesian poets actually they like the syllabic rule, so they uh, a lot of them have like created their own schools of like uh, haiku like forms, you know, like there's one called Sonian, which is instead of like what's the haiku rule, say like say five seven five uh, syllables. Uh, the, uh, the this poet who just actually just passed away, but a week ago he created this form, just like five, three, and then one syllable, and it's like hugely popular on what, online. What's the name you know? of the form? Uh, Sonian. Sonian. Uh, uh, yeah, they, they can from his name Sony, uh, and and like it's huge. Like they published all these like uh, writers published their own anthologies, and uh, they're very active, you know. Uh, even though you can't call them really mainstream, but they're massive. Um, and apart from 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 those, uh, uh, like um, like a lot of contemporary Indonesian poets now, especially the ones that uh, were multilingual, uh, a lot of us now, like um, I guess a lot of us now work in pot switch. You know, like we uh, like I did in that poem that I gave to uh, Lily. Uh, we use like uh, languages, not just um, the languages that we use every day, but the language that we consume from uh, from other countries. You know, um, so like we can we can like Google translate some Filipinos and use it. You know, I mean, and if it's and we do it, uh, we don't do it correctly. It's okay, you know. Like, <laughs> we, yeah, we it, break it, and it, it becomes a creative it. stimulus and force, right? And, and whether yes, or not yes. the Sonian becomes mainstream, it's a matter of whether we teach it in schools, right? Yeah. Instead of the sonnet yeah. and the haiku. Yeah. <clears throat> the haiku is not uh, suitable for Filipino because Filipino is polysyllabic, whereas the haiku is, oh. you know, uh, character based. So they don't go together. But uh, there was a, a group that. Uh, uh, what do you call this? Collected haikus in English, in English, but in s cell phones. So it's uh, poetry in cell phones, uh, and uh, here we can see that a very, very traditional poetic form. Uh, uh, what they call this changes shape, no? Because technology comes in and it becomes a product of technology. Of course, the Buddhism is gone because uh, the Philippines is uh, Christian, but the poetic form uh, remains experimental and it's not just written down, it is now texted. Thank you, Lily. Um, I'm going to interrupt now and we need to come to the end of this really fascinating conversation. There are so many questions that I've got um, and I'm sure you all have as well. I want to thank uh, Mikhail, Alvin and Lily, and I'd love you to join me in thanking them all for being here and providing such a provocative and amazing conversation. I'm so glad you're on stage to do this because often in unstructured places we don't get to the kind of the depth that we've been able to go to tonight because of this wonderful opportunity. So thank you to the three of you and to RMIT Culture as well and to the Capitol and all the, the people that have made this possible. Join me in thanking them now.